two parts of the detector are indicated here. This is um, yeah, a little. Um, these are some of the prototypes of the of the silicon devices. Um, it's amazing that right at the, the central tracker, um, with this enormously high radiation, there. Um, silicon devices, so it's basically a computer chip, but by um, biasing the silicon in a particular way, you can actually make it so that it detects ionization. And so um, by using the technology that's used in making silicon chips, you can then produce uh, detectors with enormously high resolution and very, very fine grain. So the ultimate detector is a pixel detector. And in the central tracker, there's a layer of pixels, so we get a, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the track. Um, but it's very expensive technology, and it can only be done on a relatively small scale. You can't make a muon system out of pixels, although that would be absolutely ideal. It would just cost an enormous amount of money. What is the most amount of money? <laughs> How many zeros? Oh, well, how many zeros? Well, I think overall Atlas may cost about a billion dollars. Billion, okay. that's um, it. So I'm money. talking multiple billions of dollars. And it would be technologically very difficult, if not impractical. Yeah. Collision of uh, <laughs> I think what we do is um, yeah, lots of groups. So who's in control of the control? The collaboration. We don't have one controller. I got it. All right. Well, this is the. Um, the Atlas control room, <laughs> and um, it looks like probably any other control room of any other big scientific facility. It's not quite NASA standards, but anyway, <laughs> we have uh, banks of computers, and you can see the signs uh, on each bank, and each sign is related to the particular a part of the experiment. So, for example, this is the silicon tracker. That's the liquid argon. Uh, tile calorimeter. The muons over there. The trigger over there. Uh, and then behind these and these desks here are sort of the the main uh, over controllers, the ones who control each one of the subsystems. So it's organized in a way that, as I mentioned, the detector is built, namely each one of the components, the central tracker and the muon system, generates its own data. And then the data for the event, and the triggers, of course, are coordinated with the central trigger processor. So once the trigger uh, has been indicated as being of interest, then the information is collected. And it's done on a very rapid time scale because remember the collisions are once every 25 nanoseconds, and maybe 10 of these collisions. But the interesting ones are, will be on the order of maybe 100 hertz. Can I just ask who decides which ones are going to be interesting? <laughs> well, it's so actually like a decided. Or is it just a fact? Um, it's actually done by a whole series of calculations previously. So. We know, for example, uh, some of the physics traders, for example, the Higgs, yes. um, the, uh, has a set of properties. And one of the properties in, in the so-called golden mode, for example, is the Higgs can decay into four muons, um, a <coughs> mu plus, mu minus pair, and another mu plus, mu minus pair, so a total of four tracks which are penetrating the muon system. So we then say, on the basis of simulation, what the signature of that particular process looks like. And on the basis of that, when you form your electronic thresholds and so on to match that. So you, you're so alert. You've already agreed you've already, on the algorithms. That's and right. You're alert. But actually, you put your finger on something which has a soft, <laughs> subtle spot. Yeah. <laughs> because there are some, some aspects. I mean, for example, there could be some processes that some theorists could think of. Uh, or some experimentalists that might be very interesting and very bizarre. And then what you have to do is say, okay, we're going to go and try to generate a trigger for that. And one of the things about the trigger is that you, it's like any communication path, you have a limited bandwidth you have to control. 
And um, for example, it could be that the muons could make their trigger at very low threshold and hog all of the bandwidth. But that would make the calorimeter guys unhappy and it wouldn't it wouldn't be the proper physics balance. So there's contention for bandwidth uh, and you have to sort of organize your trigger and collaborate with, with everybody to have the grand synthesis to have the best window to see whatever interesting position. Is this live data that's being shown? This here? is actually a replay. Um, okay. but you can get a sense of the detector. This is the detector in the cross section so the beams are coming left and right. This is the intersection point. And now we're undergoing cosmic ray testing. So here are cosmic rays that we've actually recorded. So these green tracks are muons that are coming from cosmic rays. And, um, and then these yellow hits are, um, are information that's actually been recorded in the, in the calorimeters. So this is a very nice event, <laughs> a typical event. So you can see the red are the trigger chambers that triggered on the event. So we're now exercising the system. Um, the cosmic ray came down and interacted in the calorimeter, and it went all the way through the intersection point and interacted on the other side. Mm -hmm. And the muons are very penetrating, so the ray down below is much smaller than the ray in Denver or on the mountaintop, but nevertheless, we use the muons uh, cosmic rays to, to debug the system electronically. And now what we're doing is going through a series of what's called milestone runs. So everybody gets a detector to work, and then we all come in here, and there are 50 people in here, and it's noisy, and then everybody has to get organized. Then we run for a week, 24 hours, and try to report cosmic rays. And then you discover, ah, oh, this chamber doesn't work, or this is inefficient, and uh, you exercise the whole system.